In the ancient tapestry of time, where empires rose and fell like celestial constellations, one name emerged as a harbinger of both brilliance and chaos, Hannibal Barca. Hannibal, a name whispered in awe and trepidation, a strategist whose mind danced with the stars and whose footsteps echoed through the ages. In the crucible of his youth, a flame was kindled, a fire that would burn through history, leaving an indelible mark on the parchment of time. As the storm clouds gathered over the ancient sea, so did the winds of war, heralding the rise of Hannibal, the Stormbringer. Against the canvas of fate, Hannibal painted his own destiny, crossing mountains that dared to defy him, and challenging the very gods who watched from above. In the heart of the ancient Mediterranean, where empires clashed and destinies were forged, a young Hannibal Barca emerged, destined to become a symbol of military brilliance. Born into the prestigious Barca family, Hannibal's early years were steeped in the wisdom of warfare and the art of statecraft. He was a Carthaginian general and statesman who commanded the forces of Carthage in their battle against the Roman Republic during the Second Punic War. His father, Hamilcar Barca, a seasoned general, instilled in him the values of duty and resilience. His younger brothers were Mago and Hasdrubal, his brother-in-law was Hasdrubal the Fair, who commanded other Carthaginian armies. Hannibal lived during a period of great tension in the Mediterranean basin, triggered by the emergence of the Roman Republic as a great power with its defeat of Carthage in the First Punic War. Revanchism prevailed in Carthage, symbolized by the pledge that Hannibal made to his father to never be a friend of Rome. As a child, Hannibal witnessed the brutal aftermath of the First Punic War, a conflict that ignited the flames of vengeance within him. In 218 BC, Hannibal attacked Saguntum, modern Sagunta, Spain, an ally of Rome, in Hispania, sparking the Second Punic War. Hannibal invaded Italy by crossing the Alps with North African war elephants. In his first few years in Italy, he won a succession of victories at the Battle of Ticino, Battle of the Trebia, Lake Trasimene, and Cannae, inflicting heavy losses on the Romans. Hannibal was distinguished for his ability to determine both his and his opponents' respective strengths and weaknesses, and to plan battles accordingly. His well-planned strategies allowed him to conquer an ally with several Italian cities that were previously allied to Rome. Hannibal occupied most of southern Italy for 15 years. The Romans, led by Fabius Maximus, avoided directly engaging him, instead waging a war of attrition, the Fabian strategy. Carthaginian defeats in Hispania prevented Hannibal from being reinforced, and he was unable to win a decisive victory. A counter-invasion of North Africa, led by Roman general Scipio Africanus, forced him to return to Carthage. Hannibal was eventually defeated at the Battle of Zama, ending the war in a Roman victory. The young general displayed a cunning intellect, adopting unconventional tactics that caught the Romans off guard. His audacity on the battlefield earned him both respect and fear. Hannibal was one of the sons of Hamilcar Barca, a Carthaginian leader, and an unknown mother. He was born in what is present-day northern Tunisia, one of many Mediterranean regions colonized by the Canaanites from their homelands in Phoenicia, a region corresponding with the Mediterranean coasts of modern Lebanon and Syria. He had several sisters whose names are unknown, and two brothers, Hasdrubal and Mago. His brothers-in-law were Hasdrubal the Fair and the Namidian king Naravas. He was still a child when his sisters married, and his brothers-in-law were close associates during his father's struggles in the mercenary war and the Punic conquest of the Iberian Peninsula. 
After Carthage's defeat in the First Punic War, Hamilcar set out to improve his family's and Carthage's fortunes. With that in mind and supported by Gades, Hamilcar began the subjugation of the tribes of the Iberian Peninsula, modern Spain and Portugal. Carthage at the time was in such a poor state that it lacked a navy able to transport his army. Instead, Hamilcar had to march his forces across Numidia towards the Pillars of Hercules and then cross the Strait of Gibraltar. According to Polybius, Hannibal much later said that when he came upon his father and begged to go with him, Hamilcar agreed and demanded that he swear that as long as he lived he would never be a friend of Rome. There is even an account of him at a very young age begging his father to take him to an overseas war. In the story, Hannibal's father took him up and brought him to a sacrificial chamber. Hamilcar held Hannibal over the fire roaring in the chamber and made him swear that he would never be a friend of Rome. According to the tradition, Hannibal's oath took place in the town of Peniscola, today part of the Valencian community, Spain. Hannibal's father went about the conquest of Hispania. When his father drowned in battle, Hannibal's brother-in-law Hasdrubal the Fair succeeded to his command of the army with Hannibal, then 18 years old, serving as an officer under him. Hasdrubal pursued a policy of consolidation of Carthage's Iberian interests, even signing a treaty with Rome whereby Carthage would not expand north of the Ebro so long as Rome did not expand south of it. Hasdrubal also endeavored to consolidate Carthaginian power through diplomatic relationships with the native tribes of Iberia and native Berbers of the North African coasts. Upon the assassination of Hasdrubal in 221 BC, Hannibal, now 26 years old, was proclaimed commander-in-chief by the army and confirmed in his appointment by the Carthaginian government. The Roman scholar Livy gives a depiction of the young Carthaginian, no sooner had he arrived, the old soldiers fancied they saw Hamilcar in his youth given back to them, the same bright look, the same fire in his eye, the same trick of countenance and features. Never was one and the same spirit more skillful to meet opposition, to obey, or to command. After he assumed command, Hannibal spent two years consolidating his holdings and completing the conquest of Hispania, south of the Ebro. In his first campaign, Hannibal attacked and stormed the Alcade's strongest center, Alithia, which promptly led to their surrender, and brought Punic power close to the river Tagus. His following campaign in 220 BC was against the Vacchii to the west, where he stormed the Vacian strongholds of Helmantis and Arbucula. On his return home, laden with many spoils, a coalition of Spanish tribes, led by the Carpidani, attacked, and Hannibal won his first major battlefield success and showed off his tactical skills at the Battle of the River Tagus. Rome, fearing the growing strength of Hannibal in Iberia, made an alliance with the city of Saguntum, which lay a considerable distance south of the river Ebro, and claimed the city as its protectorate. Hannibal not only perceived this as a breach of the treaty signed with Hasdrubal, but as he was already planning an attack on Rome, this was his way to start the war. So he laid siege to the city, which fell after eight months. Hannibal sent the booty from Saguntum to Carthage, a shrewd move which gained him much support from the government, Livy records that only Hanno II the Great spoke against him. In Rome, the Senate reacted to this apparent violation of the treaty by dispatching a delegation to Carthage to demand whether Hannibal had destroyed Saguntum in accordance with orders from Carthage. The Carthaginian Senate responded with legal arguments observing the lack of ratification by either government for the treaty alleged to have been violated. The delegation's leader, Quintus Fabius Maximus Variacosus, demanded Carthage choose between war and peace, to which his audience replied that Rome could choose. Fabius chose war. As Hannibal faced the colossal might of the Roman Republic, he knew that a conventional approach would lead to defeat. 
Unyielding in his pursuit of victory, Hannibal conceived a strategy that would echo through the ages, a plan as daring as it was unprecedented. In the year 218 BCE, Hannibal, the audacious Carthaginian general, made a decision that would become the stuff of legends, he would lead his army, including war elephants, across the seemingly insurmountable Alps. A journey fought with peril, where the elements themselves became Hannibal's adversaries. The Alps, a formidable natural barrier, became both a testing ground and a strategic advantage for Hannibal. His soldiers faced not only the wrath of nature but also the skepticism of his own men. Yet, Hannibal's iron will and tactical brilliance drove them forward. Having successfully crossed the Alps, Hannibal descended upon Italy, catching the Romans off guard. His audacity reached its zenith on the plains of Cannae in 216 BCE, where he would deploy a tactical masterpiece that defied conventional military wisdom. In the spring of 216 BC, Hannibal took the initiative and seized the large supply depot at Cannae in the Apulian plain. By capturing Cannae, Hannibal had placed himself between the Romans and their crucial sources of supply. Once the Roman Senate resumed their consular elections in 216 BC, they appointed Gaius Terentius Varro and Lucius Aemilius Paulus as consuls. In the meantime, the Romans hoped to gain success through sheer strength and weight of numbers, and they raised a new army of unprecedented size, estimated by some to be as large as 100,000 men, but more likely around 50,000 to 80,000. The Romans and allied legions resolved to confront Hannibal and marched southward to Apulia. They eventually found him on the left bank of the Ophidus River, and encamped 10 kilometers away. On this occasion, the two armies were combined into one, the consuls having to alternate their command on a daily basis. According to Livy, Varro was a man of reckless and hubristic nature and it was his turn to command on the day of battle. This account is possibly biased against Varro as its main source, Polybius, was a client of Paulus's aristocratic family whereas Varro was less distinguished. Some historians have suggested that the sheer size of the army required both generals to command a wing each. This theory is supported by the fact that, after Varro survived the battle he was pardoned by the Senate, which would be peculiar if he were the sole commander at fault. Hannibal capitalized on the eagerness of the Romans and drew them into a trap by using an envelopment tactic. This eliminated the Roman numerical advantage by shrinking the combat area. Hannibal drew up his least reliable infantry in the center in a semicircle curving towards the Romans. Placing them forward of the wings allowed them room to fall back, blurring the Romans after them, while the cavalry on the flanks dealt with their Roman counterparts. Hannibal's wings were composed of the Gallic and Numidian cavalry. The Roman legions forced their way through Hannibal's weak center, but the Libyan mercenaries on the wings, swung around by the movement, menaced their flanks. Cannae would become a byword for tactical perfection. Hannibal's forces, though vastly outnumbered, decimated the Roman army. The magnitude of the victory reverberated across the ancient world, leaving Rome stunned and Hannibal immortalized. Due to these brilliant tactics, Hannibal managed to surround and destroy all but a small remnant of his enemy, despite his own inferior numbers. Depending upon the source, it is estimated that 50,000 to 70,000 Romans were killed or captured. Among the dead were Roman consul Lucius Aemilius Paulus, two consuls for the preceding year, two quaestors, 29 of the 48 military tribunes, and an additional 80 senators. At a time when the Roman Senate was composed of no more than 300 men, this constituted 25 to 30 percent of the governing body. 
This makes the battle one of the most catastrophic defeats in the history of ancient Rome, and one of the bloodiest battles in all of human history, in terms of the number of lives lost in a single day. After Cannae, the Romans were very hesitant to confront Hannibal in pitched battle, preferring instead to weaken him by attrition, relying on their advantages of interior lines, supply, and manpower. As a result, Hannibal fought no more major battles in Italy for the rest of the war. It is believed that his refusal to bring the war to Rome itself was due to a lack of commitment from Carthage of men, money, and material, principally siege equipment. Whatever the reason, the choice prompted Maharbal to say, Hannibal, you know how to gain a victory, but not how to use one. As a result of this victory, many parts of Italy joined Hannibal's cause. As Polybius notes, how much more serious was the defeat of Cannae, than those that preceded it can be seen by the behavior of Rome's allies, before that fateful day, their loyalty remained unshaken, now it began to waver for the simple reason that they despaired of Roman power. During that same year, the Greek cities in Sicily were induced to revolt against Roman political control, while Macedonian King Philip V pledged his support to Hannibal, initiating the First Macedonian War against Rome. Hannibal also secured an alliance with newly appointed tyrant Hieronymus of Syracuse. It is often argued that, if Hannibal had received proper material reinforcements from Carthage, he might have succeeded with a direct attack upon Rome. Instead, he had to content himself with subduing the fortresses that still held out against him, and the only other notable event of 216 BC was the defection of certain Italian territories, including Capua, the second largest city of Italy, which Hannibal made his new base. However, only a few of the Italian city-states that he had expected to gain as allies defected to him. Hannibal's audacious crossing of the Alps and his unparalleled victory at Kenny showcased not only his military genius but also his ability to rewrite the rules of war. The bold strategy of an extraordinary leader had not only defied the odds but had etched Hannibal Barca's name in the annals of history, a name synonymous with audacity and brilliance. As the dust settled on the battlefields, Carthage found itself torn between political turmoil and internal strife. Despite Hannibal's remarkable military successes, jealousy and mistrust within the Carthaginian political elite grew. Dramatized scenes of political unrest and betrayal unfold. In a cruel twist of fate, Hannibal faced exile from his beloved Carthage. The city he had defended with unwavering dedication was now consumed by internal strife and external threats. Hannibal, however, was not defeated. The Romans intervened and threatened Bithynia into giving up Hannibal. Prusias agreed, but the general was determined not to fall into his enemy's hands. The precise year and cause of Hannibal's death are unknown. Pausanias wrote that Hannibal's death occurred after his finger was wounded by his drawn sword while mounting his horse, resulting in a fever and then his death three days later. Cornelius Nepos and Livy tell a different story, namely that the ex-consul Titus Quinctius Flamininus, on discovering that Hannibal was in Bithynia, went there in an embassy to demand his surrender from King Prusias. Hannibal, discovering that the castle where he was living was surrounded by Roman soldiers and he could not escape, took poison. Appian writes that it was Prusias who poisoned Hannibal. Pliny the Elder and Plutarch, in his Life of Flamininus, record that Hannibal's tomb was at Labissa on the coast of the Sea of Marmara. According to some, Labissa was sighted at Gebs, between Bursa and Uskadar. W. M. Leek identifying Gebs with ancient Dacabiza, placed it further west. Before dying, Hannibal is said to have left behind a letter declaring, 
Let us relieve the Romans from the anxiety they have so long experienced, since they think it tries their patience too much to wait for an old man's death. Appian wrote of a prophecy about Hannibal's death, which stated that, Libis and earth shall cover Hannibal's remains. This, he wrote, made Hannibal believe that he would die in Libya, but instead, it was at the Bithynian Libissa that he would die. Exiled but not broken, Hannibal wandered through different lands seeking refuge. Yet, even in exile, his influence remained potent. Hannibal's exile became a period of unexpected significance. His military strategies and tactical genius continued to inspire future commanders and leaders. He became a sought-after advisor, sought not only for his military expertise but also for his profound understanding of strategy and diplomacy. From Scipio Africanus to Napoleon Bonaparte, military leaders studied and admired Hannibal's tactics. The Battle of Cannae, in particular, remained a timeless lesson in the art of war. Hannibal Barca's legacy extends far beyond the pages of history. His strategic brilliance, courage in the face of adversity, and the indomitable will to challenge the status quo continue to inspire generations. From ancient commanders to modern military theorists, Hannibal's lessons endure, reminding us that the echoes of his genius still resonate in the corridors of power and the hearts of those who seek victory against all odds. Hannibal Barca, the mastermind of the ancient world, lives on, not just in history books but in the very essence of strategic thinking and the pursuit of greatness against insurmountable challenges. Hannibal's journey, marked by hardship and triumph, transcends the boundaries of history. His story, like a masterpiece painted on the canvas of time, reminds us that true greatness lies not only in victory but in the indomitable spirit to defy the odds. Hannibal Barca, the visionary general who dared to dream beyond the limits of his era, continues to inspire generations. His legacy is not just a chapter in history but a timeless testament to the human spirit's capacity for brilliance, resilience, and innovation. As we bid farewell to the shadows of the past, may the spirit of Hannibal Barca ignite the flames of courage in our hearts, reminding us that even in the face of adversity, greatness can be forged. The echoes of Hannibal's journey linger in the air, inviting us to explore, to dream, and to conquer the challenges that await us. Hannibal Barca's legacy endures, an everlasting beacon lighting the way for those who dare to journey into the realms of the extraordinary.